one of the great radio themes of the past that in the 40s graced our Bakelite boxes in the corner when we heard the great serials, soap operas and dramas that uh, Australian radio was famous for. And a man who played a big part in those is our next guest, Bud Tingle. Good evening. Good evening, Bruce. And, and from me too, uh, Bud, hi to you. And we want to know uh, when they stopped calling you Charles and when they started calling you Bud. Well, actually, it was before I was born. I was born in Coogee in Sydney, and the Coogee Surf Club, uh, were my father and my uncles all belonged to the Coogee Surf Club. My mother was very tiny, very slim, and when I, when she was pregnant, I was apparently very obvious, so I was known as the Bud at Coogee Surf Club in Sydney until I was born, and uh, after a while, uh, I think I stayed as the Bud for a long time. There were a lot of jokes about what's budding there and that sort of thing, and my mother always said it started long before I was born. Then, great film director Tom McCready, who gave me my big break in 1947, gave me the lead in two of his films, Another Dawn and Into the Strait. He heard the story, so he put Bud in brackets behind Charles on my first big credit up on the screen, starring Charles Bud in brackets Tingle. Well, it may have been good luck for you, Bud. And then Bob Dyer took it up. When Bob, I started to work for Bob Dyer a few years later, uh, doing assistant compare work, and he always introduced me as Charles Bud Tingle, sometimes Buddy Tingle, and I heard a lady ring up earlier in your program thinking, uh, wondering who it was who introduced me. It was Bob Dyer on uh, Pick a Box and cop the lot. Always said, thank you, Charles Bud Tingle. Gee, that's lovely. Yes, you were Bob's announcer for some time, weren't you? That's right, yes, and that was that was always another dawn, and Tom McCready and Tom McCready's film, because uh, uh, a, a very, uh, uh, one of the actors in the, in the show was also doing some work for Bob Dyer. He had to go away on tour somewhere, and he recommended me to take over from him, and uh, that's how I got the job. Was he a good fellow to work with, Charles? Who was that, Bob? Bob, yeah. He had a he had a deal with me, which he said, look, he, he, he was terribly kind. Uh, he said, whenever you want to go away and do a film, just let me know, and I'll get somebody in temporarily to take over on the understanding that they step aside when you come back. Now, that was almost a utopian deal. I heard Myrtle Woods talking about her excellent deal, and I agree with her. I didn't ask for an awful lot of money from Bob. It was a, a generous fee for those days, as Myrtle Woods' uh, fee was, and... Uh, I stayed with Bob for many, many years until I eventually went overseas to do my part in the Shirley, the, the studio scenes in London. Are you still in touch with his widow Dolly, who I understand lives in retirement on the Gold Coast, yeah. Bud? We've been in touch. It was after after Bob died, and uh, I, in fact, I'm glad you mentioned that because I must give her a ring to see how she's going. I haven't spoken to her for quite some time. You might twist her arm and tell her we'd love to talk to her on Remember When and assure her, Bud, how painless it is, will you? I certainly will. <laughs> it wasn't just Bob Dyer, but the other great radio uh, great in Jack Davey. Yeah. Your paths crossed. In, very early in your career. Oh, my first professional job was in a, uh, a radio serial in Sydney called uh, Billy Bunter of Greyfriars, based on those uh, old English comic uh, strips. And uh, I, uh, we used to, I was at school in Sydney, and uh, I used to walk across the, the Hyde Park, uh, go up to the top of the TNG building, and I played Bob Cherry with Jack Davey as Billy Bunter, and people like Howard Craven as, uh, as Harry Wharton, I think he was, and uh, Ronald Morse, Red Edmund Phillips, uh, I think, co-wrote it with John Appleton, uh, and uh, that was when I was either 16 or 17. Well, movies took a big part in Bud Tingwell's life when you travelled to England. Uh, yes, I, I didn't go to England to seek my career. I was helped to go there by, sadly, the late, uh, in the last couple of weeks, Leslie Norman. Leslie Norman, who came out to direct the Shirley. I'd worked with Les before on a couple of other things, including a small part in Eureka Stockade. He was out, I think, as producer and editor on that. And uh, then he came out to direct the Shirley, and both Jack Ricks, his associate producer, uh, and Les put it to me. They said, look, if you'd like to go to England to do your studio stuff, we can't give you the full all, all expenses paid, sort of Hollywood fan magazine type stuff, but we can give you a few extra days so that you probably won't be out of pocket. And uh, I remember asking Peter Finch if he thought that was a good idea, and Peter said, uh, Peter was playing the lead in Shirley, and was an old mate from the radio days, and he said, look, he said, it's much better to say you're going to work in England rather than to say you're going to look for work in England, accept it. So I did, and thanks to Les and Jack uh, 
uh, Ricks. Uh, I went to England just to finish my part in the Shira Lee. And my wife uh, came with me, of course, and uh, uh, we were going to stay on in England and have a look at television over there. Uh, I'd had a trip to Hollywood a couple of years before, and I'd studied telly there, and I was doing the Desert Rats. And uh, uh, we were going to come back to Australia because telly had just started and uh, say we've studied television. But I got one of the leads in a, an experimental a television series uh, called Emergency Ward 10 and instead of it running for a few weeks it ran on and on and on and on and I stayed with it for many years so it was a kind of an accidental move to England which worked out very well. I first met you I think in England in 1965 on the set uh, about of Murder Most Foul with Robert Morley and Margaret Rutherford. Wow what happy memories you know. Yes. You know I, we made those films in the 60s as you say and uh, 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 last year, I got a letter from a, an independent Hollywood producer asking me if I would go to America to do something, if he can get the money for a film. He's going to do, try and do a series of films very like those, but for the American video market. He's based in Milwaukee, and we're still in touch. He hasn't quite got the money up yet. But I said to him, you know, those films are 30 years old. He said, yes, I know. And I <laughs> was suddenly trying to tell him I'm much older. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but he, a uh, nice man called Dan Gernsel, and uh, if he gets the money up, he wants me to go over there to uh, do all thanks to those films 30, just, it's over 30 years ago now. But, Tingwell, what has been your finest hour so far? <laughs> Honestly, I don't know. I had the great pleasure of, of doing one of those, having a go at everything. I wrote a stage play in England called 54321, uh, obviously with a sort of telly background. Um, I got together with some mates, uh, I must admit, from the old emergency ward, 10 days, and uh, we mounted it uh, as a production, uh, got our act together and rehearsed it in London, took it out on tour, and uh, I played the lead in it, and it was directed by David Butler, one of my, he used to play my anaesthetist in emergency. Emergency Ward 10, and uh, uh, we toured it very successfully. That that was a, a great thrill to have, to have had an idea, put it down on a piece of paper, and eventually rehearse it and do it. And actually, you know, we we were quite successful. But tell us about Margaret Rutherford. Was she a tough old nut to get on with? Ah, uh, one of the great great women, great lady, I suppose you should say. Uh, interesting saying that Myrtle Wood started late uh, was. Uh, uh, what did you say, 40, I think, when she... 43. Margaret Rutherford was, too. I also believe uh, Dame Edith Evans started late, Irene Handel. My wife thinks Flora Robson also started late. And it's interesting, uh, Margaret came from, uh, I th was a teacher. Uh, she was a very gentle person who did a lot of very, very good work for people like prisoners. She used to go around teaching English to prisoners, would allow no publicity about that. Was a lovely, gentle woman with a very, very great sense of humor, a quiet uh, sense of humor, very, very intelligent and just l wonderful to work with. Talk to us about your association with Hector Crawford and all the success you enjoyed in the Crawford years, bud. Well, that started thanks to Michael Pate. Uh, this would have been, what, in 1972. And I suddenly remembered that Audrey and I hadn't sent a usual Christmas card to Michael and Philippa Pate. And we'd got a nice card from them. Uh, and uh, uh, Christmas 71, I guess it was. So some months later, um, I was playing the lead in uh, Girl in My Soup in London. Uh, and uh, I dropped an air letter to Michael saying, terribly sorry, I forgot the Christmas card. We're thinking of coming home for a trip as soon as I finish my run. And uh, halfway through the year, uh, look forward to seeing you. Next thing I know, I got a delightful letter from Hector Crawford saying that Philippa Pate tells me that you're thinking of coming home for a trip as soon as your London season is over. Uh, if you do, would you like to come and do some work for us? Well, there's a lot of publicity when we arrived home uh, halfway through 72, and uh, uh, Hector got in touch, and I came down to play Jackie Weaver's father in an episode of Division 4. And uh, my first scene was with Gerard Kennedy and David Cameron, uh, directed by George Snowy Miller, up on top of the Big Dipper, the track at, uh, at Luna Park. And uh, uh, after uh, apparently having survived that, uh, Hector then asked me if I'd take over from Alwyn Kurtz, who just resigned for, uh, as the inspector in Homicide. So we agreed to do it for one year, and here we are 20 years later still here.
Back to your early days with Peter Finch. Was he a, a bit of a rabble rouser as a young man? No, great bloke. Uh, well, I, I, I think I think we had been known to have a few beers together after work. He was a very dedicated actor. Did some wonderful work in the theatre, both in the army, and then he continued that on with actors like Alan White, who's been in England for many years. Uh, did some very serious, good, high standard theatre. And uh, uh, suddenly he got a, uh, because of the plays he was taking round to factories in Sydney, uh, Laurence Olivier and Vivian Lee had gone to see him in one of the plays, were so impressed they invited him to England. And I can remember doing a, a, a radio show with Alan White and Peter Finch, I think it was the day before they were due to sail for England. Uh, and he was a bit depressed because he thought he was too old. I think he was then 34 and I was about 27 or 28. And uh, he said, I'm too old to be going to England. You ought to be going. And several beers later, we thought we'd convinced him it was a good idea to go to England. What, what do you mean the shows he took around to factories? Oh, he got, he continued this work, wonderful work he did in the army. He was in one of the fighting units in the Australian army in the Middle East. When he got back to the to Australia, they said, look, with his, he had a tremendous reputation even in those days, as one of our leading actors, both film and uh, and particularly radio, and the army asked him to, uh, I mean, he may have put it to the army, but certainly the army, the Australian army, approved him forming a drama unit, and they took very thoughtful, good theatre around to the soldiers just behind the front line. And that formed the basis of his post-war theatre group. Uh, it's a bit under-researched, all this. I can't understand why people haven't seized on it, because it's a very exciting Australian theatrical enterprise that you know, perhaps uh, a good journalist might uh, try and look into. It, it, it was excellent, and of course it did work to his own advantage. And so many others, like Alan White and lots of our very good actors, got their start working with Peter Fitch's company. During the day, of course, he was doing radio work. Uh, playing the lead in lots of series and serials and winning the uh, the Macquarie Radio Theatre Drama Award of the Year and that sort of thing. But uh, uh, his main love was the theatre, and uh, I think he allowed his radio work to subsidise his excellent work in the theatre. It was mostly done as a, on an amateur basis, too, with great dedication. But did you ever work with Errol Flynn? No, I didn't. But my brother, who's an airline captain, I was, he's retired now, in Qantas, wrote to me, he said, I had the great pleasure of having a beer with Errol Flynn. He was in a bar somewhere in, you know, wherever they were flying to, and he looked around and there was this bloke who looked very familiar, and uh, Errol Flynn spoke to him and said, hey, wait a minute, you're with that Australian airline Qantas? He said, yes, oh, I'm Errol Flynn, and they had a few beers together. He said, and I said, what was he like? He said, beaut bloke. Mm. And that's how my closest contact with Flynn. Late, later in life, uh, our paths crossed when you were doing the Colin Carpenter show, and you were producing uh, uh, Colin out there at Channel 10. What aspect of your life did you enjoy most, Bud? Was it the production? Uh, was it acting in front of the footlights or radio? It's terribly hard to say, Bruce. I've been so privileged. It was Tom McCready all those uh, years ago in 47, 48. Uh, when they asked me to do a second film for them in 48, I said, well, uh, and he paid me a, a retainer uh, about 15 times a week or something, which was a lot of money. I said, I must do something to earn it. He allowed me to work with the editor, Alec Ezard, as a, a sort of an assistant. Soon I was writing a script for him or rewriting, a, doing a, a screenplay draft of a, of a script he'd been handed in. And uh, I uh, did some second unit directing. So way back then, I had a tremendous uh, to do as much as I could over as broad a range of tasks because I just loved the business so much. And it was Hector Crawford who allowed me, although I did a lot of directing in England in the theatre, uh, it was Hector who uh, invited me to do some directing on telly when Homicide was, uh, uh, was cancelled eventually. And uh, uh, I became a director and a producer for him and I now sort of freelance as a a bit of anything. I've just finished a run in Neighbours as an actor, and at my age, I turned 70 last month, uh, I'm, uh, you know, amazed that uh, I'm still able to work uh, doing all the things I love doing. Oh, well, you've got the talent. Uh -huh. And long may continue, and you do a lot of good work behind the scenes, too. What's your involvement with the Association for the Blind in Kooyong, bud? Oh, well, I, I, I was listening to their radio station, 3RPH, one day, driving home from work in the car, and, and I heard them say, we're looking for volunteer readers. Uh, if you'd like to volunteer uh, uh, to read newspapers and stories over the air, please contact us. So I rang them and uh, told them who I was, and they said, yes, uh, okay, would you come and do an audition. I said, well, I've got a lot of experience. Yes, it doesn't matter. You must do an audition. 
So I rather like that. Went out and did my audition for 3RPH. I passed it. And uh, every now and again, they asked me to go and read things and sometimes read a book and uh, sometimes read newspapers and do a lot of their announcements too. They're a marvellous organisation and it's a tremendous radio station. I mustn't uh, uh, rave about the opposition, but I don't think we are in opposition. We're Not really, no. It's for people of limited vision. That's right. So people who have a little difficulty in holding books and like very elderly people. Well, now uh, that you've come into your 70s and possibly the best time of your life, the best years of your life, what would you hope to achieve in the next decade, Bud Tingwell? <laughs> uh, just... A, a, a bit more of the same. Um, I must admit, uh, having worked in Neighbours, I'm getting a bit of an urge to be a television director again, so uh, I'm going to try and drop a few heavy hints around to see if they'll let me direct a, an, an episode or two of Neighbours or something like that. I'd, 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 look, whatever turns up, I do voiceovers, as you probably know, and things like that, and whatever turns up, I find it very, very exciting just to be asked to do it and hopefully be asked to come back and do something else. Well, that's what keeps you young. You're keeping abreast of the times and you're working in the 90s and that's what uh, keeps you on your toes, I'm sure of it. Yes, I'll, I, listen, I loved what you were saying about, uh, you know, the, the shows and things. Uh, could I tell you a, a gentle little story about Frank Sinatra? Yes, yes, we please. were talking about him just before you came on air. I heard that, and I'm thrilled a bit about Tom Berlinson because uh, uh, doing his voice, because I played Tom's father in a film called Windrider a few years ago. But many years ago, in that first concert uh, tour that Sinatra did, uh, my wife, I was down here rehearsing a play with Googie Withers and John McCallum, and we were booked to see the second night of Frank Sinatra's concert. The f after the first night, that famous stadium actually burnt down and they put Sinatra on at the Melbourne Town Hall. There were only about 300 people there because nobody knew where he was, and he was quite delightful. The following week, I went up to Sydney to see my... Uh, Audrey and I went up to just for the weekend to see parents and things before the season started down here, and John Ewart and his then-wife, Bunny, my mother and father and Audrey and I went to see Sinatra again, but at the stadium. To see this same wonderful performer, uh, I think Nancy came on stage with him. It was just, just, just marvellous. And Dad was so impressed that as Sinatra came up the aisle, surrounded by all sorts of people, you know, and people trying to get to him for autographs, and Dad, looking rather distinguished, very grey-haired, uh, he was sitting on the end of the aisle, put his hand up and said, congratulations, Mr. Sinatra. And Sinatra stopped, looked at dad and went oh gee thanks very much sir took dad's hand and shook it looked as if he didn't know what to say and then they shepherded him on and as dad said he turned around and he said oh, i'm not going to wash that for a long time that <laughs> such a delightful thing and i remember uh, sometime uh, 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 later I, I, I was talking to, uh, to peter lawford about sinatra and because uh, i'd worked with peter some years before and uh, they all said a great bloke there was a lot of publicity, a lot of controversy, but that one little moment with my dad, I thought... Well, that wasn't portrayed in his life story, I'm sad to tell you, bud. Sorry? It, it wasn't portrayed in the four-hour video life story of Sinatra, the experience with your father. Well, no, no, I, <laughs> it was a tiny moment. <laughs> but you'd enjoy the tape, try and get hold of it. Must do. Mm. Well, bud, we're going to go out on a piece of radio history, and that's the Lux Radio Theatre. And as we play this, I can can think of a young young Bud Tingle striding up to the AWA microphone along with people like Dinah Shearing and Peter Finch and presenting that night's General Motors Hour or Lux Radio Theatre. And it's a great tribute to, to talk to a piece of radio history tonight in Bud Tingle. Happy 70th birthday to you, Bud. Thank you very much indeed, Philip Andrews. Yeah.